dear virtual participants of lisa lecture series good morning to all dignitaries guests and virtual participants of this inaugural function of lisa lecture series i feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all the virtual participants of this event today is the first day of national library week i wish you all lis professionals a very happy national library week i would like to begin the event with a beautiful quote of confucius a chinese philosopher the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away a small stones to accomplish any major task one must make a tiny steps in order to get it done if you remove one stone from the mountain at a time you will eventually move the whole mountain itself the present initiative is a humble effort of lis academy to build a strong community of lis professionals dear participant friends lis academy is launching a lecture series of eminent speakers in the lis domain and experts from among the important stakeholders of library it is proposed to organize lectures every second saturday of the month in this connection lis academy has planned an inaugural function of the lisa lecture series today padma bhushan professor p balram former director indian institute of science bangalore and a renowned biochemist of our country is with us today to inaugurate and deliver a monthly lecture series to the virtual audience we have professor td kempraju honorable vice chancellor bangalore north university kolar who will presiding over the inaugural function and will moderate the first lecture delivered by professor balram with this brief about today's event i request professor pv konnur president lis academy to brief about lis academy and about this event to all of you he will also welcome the guests on the dais and introduce them to the virtual audience professor konnur please good morning to everyone i welcome all of you to this virtual event respected chief guest of this occasion padma bhushan professor p balram ji honorable dst yos chair professor national center for biological sciences ncbs tifr bangalore and former director of indian institute of science bangalore the president of this occasion professor td kempraju honorable vice chancellor of bengaluru north university kolar dr anand bhairappa librarian indian institute of science bangalore and his colleagues dr meera former librarian rri bangalore and dr b s sivaram senior technical officer nal bangalore representatives from press and media the invited and all the virtual participants of this lisa lecture series ladies and gentlemen it gives me an immense pleasure in welcoming all of you to this inaugural function of the lisa lecture series and to the first lecture of series being delivered by professor balaram sir i am delighted to brief you a little about the lis academy and its activities here the lis academy library and information science academy is a professional charitable trust established to work for the professional development and to assist libraries with state of art technology the academy's primary focus is to provide need based service to the different types of libraries in the country and to work for the advancement of library and information science profession at large the lis academy has a tagline learn inspire serve it aims to become the best active and dynamic professional body by supporting professionals with essential knowledge skill and values of librarianship using innovative and cutting edge technology and adopting best and fair practices and creative ideas 
The Elias Academy aims to spread the librarianship profession's multidimensional utility and overall growth through education, literature, research, publication, outsource, training programs, consultation, and collaboration. The Elias Academy has organized several programs since its inception 2016. Three national conferences were organized, one in Bangalore in collaboration with the Department of Public Libraries and the second one in Belgavi in collaboration with VTU Belgavi. And the third national conference was organized virtually in collaboration with University of Hyderabad recently during 27th to 30th August 2020. The Academy has also collaborated with JNTU Anantapuram and AICT in New Delhi in organizing the second Tech VC conclave on 13 to 14th February 2020. With this brief about LIS Academy, I would like to brief a little about LISA lecture series. LIS Academy, as observed by the entire profession at large, desires to serve the profession differently. With this vision, the Alliance Academy formed a core committee to organize monthly lecture series under the chairmanship of Professor T.D. Kemperaju along with a team of outstanding professionals as its members. The committee has formulated the guidelines and the type of personalities to be invited for delivering lectures on this platform. Accordingly, it was decided by the committee to invite Professor Balram to inaugurate the lecture series and to deliver its first lecture. The other speakers who have been identified by the committee and those who have accepted to deliver the subsequent lectures for the series are as follows. December lecture on 12th December 2020 will be delivered by Professor Sahasrabudhi, Chairman ACTE New Delhi. January lecture on 9th January 2021 will be delivered by Professor H.A. Ranganath, former director, NAC, and former vice chancellor, Bangalore University. February lecture on 14th February 2021 will be delivered by Professor Sudha Rao, former CEO, Karnataka Jnana Ayog, and former vice chancellor, KSOU Mysuru. The committee has also listed out the potential speakers for the successive months of 2021 and we will be announcing the names of from time to time. With this brief about LIS Academy and LISA lecture series, I am delighted to welcome and introduce the dignitaries on the dais. The chief guest of this function, a pride son of India, an eminent scientist par excellence and lover of libraries and librarians the best blend of researcher, academician, and administrator, former director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Professor P. Balram, an intellectual asset of our country, a down-to-earth and a humble person. When we requested Professor Balram, he readily agreed to inaugurate the LISA lecture series and deliver the series first lecture. Sir, your blessings bestowed on the librarian community will go a long way in strengthening Elias' profession. It is very difficult to frame the personality of Professor Balram in few words. He is a well-known personality in the map of Indian scientific giants and the higher education system since four decades. Professor Balram obtained his BSc in 1967 from Pune University MSc 1969 from IIT Kanpur and PhD 1972 in chemistry from Carnegie Mellon University, USA. He was a research associate at Harvard University in 1972 to 73 and he served on the Indian Institute of Science faculty, Bengaluru, from 1973 to 2014. He was the director of institute from 2005 to 2014 and he has contributed extensively to the areas of molecular biophysics and chemical biology. He was the editor of Current Science from 1995 to 2013. 
he authored over 300 editorials on diverse subjects related to science and scientists. He is the recipient of several awards and honors, including Padma Sri 2002, Padma Bhushan 2014, and he is the recipient of R. Bruce Merrifield Award 2021 of the American Peptide Society. He is currently associated with National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, as DSTYOS Chair Professor. With this brief, I welcome Professor Balramji to this virtual gathering of researchers, academicians, and LIS professionals of India and outside India. I request Dr. Meera to offer a bouquet to Professor Balram as a token of our respect. The president of this occasion, Professor T.D. Kemparaju, is well-known person to the profession of librarianship. He is the founder, vice chancellor of Bangalore North University, my guru, joint personality among LIS community. Professor T.D. Kemparaju is an outstanding LIS teacher and regarded as a torch bearer of the Indian LIS profession of this generation. Professor T.D. Kemparaju, apart from an exceptional teacher, he has proved his capabilities as an able administrator. He has also served in various positions during his tenure, such as Director of Distance Education, Bangalore University, Registrar Bangalore University during 2012 to 2013, Registrar Bangalore University during 2015 to 16, Special Officer Bangalore North University during 2015 to 17. Presently, he is serving as Vice Chancellor of Bangalore North University, Kolar. Professor T.D. Kemparaju has been awarded LIS Academy Lifetime Achievement Award in the year 2017. With this brief about Professor Kemparaju, I welcome him to this function and request Dr. Nirmala, Deputy Librarian, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, to offer a bouquet to Professor Kemparaju as a token of our respect. <music> Friends, when we approached Dr. Anand Bhairapam to host this inaugural event at Indian Institute of Science, he readily agreed and provided all the facilities for organizing this event. I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Anand Bhairapa and all his colleagues to this function. The LIS Academy always believes in inclusiveness. The LIS profession is very small, but we serve a large group of academicians and research community. We prefer to define our family with the LIS profession and our stakeholders. I welcome all the virtual participants of this event to this function. Last but not the least, I welcome all representatives of press and media. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Konnur, for your welcome remarks and introducing the guests. Now, I request the dignitaries on the dais to light the lamp to signify the beginning of this event. Light is a symbol of brightness and prosperity. As sunlight expels the darkness of might, similarly, blessing brings in our life prosperity and happiness. To make this morning a blessed one, invoke Goddess Saraswati by kindling the lamp of knowledge and wisdom. For seeking the choicest blessings for the same, I invite our chief guest, Padma Bhushan, Professor P. Balram, and Professor T.D. Kemparaju and other dignitaries on the dais to light the lamp. LIS Academy, since its inception, has a practice of recognizing the successful persons from LIS domain and other domains who have contributed richly to their domain and to the society at large. 
Accordingly, during the first LISA conference, we awarded Lifetime Achievement Award to two personalities, Dr. T.D. Kemparaju, former LIS professor and Vice Chancellor, Bangalore North University, Kolar, and Dr. P.Y. Rajendra Kumar, former Director General, National Library, Kolkata. During our second conference, we awarded Lifetime Achievement Award for two eminent personalities. They are Professor Karishidappa, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Vitu Belagavi, and Dr. H.S. Siddhamalaya, former librarian, Nimans, Bangalore. During this year, our conference was announced to be held at Central University, Hyderabad, but unfortunately, we could not conduct the conference physically due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hence, we decided to include this year award function in the inaugural function of LISA lecture series. When we approached Professor P. Balram to accept our request of awarding him the Lifetime Achievement Award, he asked us why you desire to give me this award. I have not contributed at LIS profession in general and to the LIS academy in particular. Sir, you have been recognized by Government of India with one of the highest award Padma Bhushan for your contributions to the science and research. We are very small to award you a lifetime achievement award. However, we are getting honored by honoring you. With this brief, I request the president of this occasion, Professor T.D. Kemparaj and other dignitaries on the dais to join us felicitation ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, many greetings to all of you on the inaugural day of National Library Week 2020. I also would like to wish you all a very happy and safe Deepavali. I am personally honored and privileged to read out the citation that is going to be bestowed upon uh, Padma Bhushan Professor P. Balram, who, is the, who was the former director of Indian Institute of Science by LIS Academy, Bangalore. It is the proud privilege of the President and Board of Trustees of LIS Academy, Bangalore, to honor Professor P. Balram, an eminent scientist, educationist, dedicated administrator, and visionary who exemplify integrity, leadership, commitment, and outstanding contributions for the benefit of science education and research. LIS Academy is pleased to appreciate Professor Balram's accomplishments as the director, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His dedicated service as a member of the Science Advisory Committee to the Union Cabinet and Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister is noteworthy. His pioneering research work in natural peptides, peptide design and conformational analysis, mass spectrometry of proteins and peptides, computational analysis, on protein structure is remarkable. Professor Balram's contributions to the field of scholarly publishing as an author, reviewer, and editor are commendable. He has authored more than 400 research publications and has served as editor of several prestigious journals. He is decorated with several honors, to name a few, Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize of CSIR in the year 1986, TWA's Award in Chemistry in 1994, Padma Shri in 2002, and Padma Bhushan by the Government of India in 2014. The LIS Academy is delighted to bestow this special commendation as Professor Balram is a doyan living up to the goals and principles of this prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award for the year 2020 on the 14th day of November 2020. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir, for kindly accepting our felicitation. Now I request you to kindly deliver first lecture of Lisa lecture series. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the LIS Academy for 
inviting me to give this uh, first lecture in the seminar series and also to give me the privilege of talking during the National Library Week. Uh, the subject that I'm going to talk to you this morning is the subject of science publishing. And I have titled my lecture, as you can see on my first slide, as Greed, Vanity, and the Decline of Scholarship. So I am going to tell you something about how the history of science publishing has brought publishing to a stage where I think we are in the midst of a major crisis. In the backdrop in the first slide, you will see the J.R.D. Tata Memorial Library of the Indian Institute of Science. This is the library which, in which I spent much of my first 30 years at the Indian Institute of Science. From 1974 to 2005, I was a regular visitor to this library and would spend a great deal of time every week in the library. In 2005, when I became the director of the Indian Institute of Science, of course, I spent less and less time in the library. But 2005 was also the time when the internet came in full force into the campus. And by that time, we all had begun to look and turn to computers for all our information. At the beginning of my lecture, I would like to show you a favorite quote of mine. This is by Lewis Carroll, writing under his real name, Charles Dodson. He was the author of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, and he made a definition of man. He said the proper definition of a man is an animal that writes letters, because in the 19th century, everybody wrote letters to everybody. Even in the 20th century, everybody wrote letters to everyone else. We all wrote letters until email came along towards the end of the 20th century. And we no longer write emails. What we do is we write, uh, we tweet, or we send messages on our smartphones. But what are scientists? How do you define scientists? I would like to use paraphrase Carol and define scientists as animals who like to write papers. So they still like to write pa papers. And Therefore, the field of scientific publishing has grown over many centuries. The first scientific journal, and that is pictured on my slide here, is dated to 1665. That is the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. It's a journal which has completed well over 350 years of existence. But in the 17th century, there was only one journal. The other journals came later. All these journals came in Europe, they came in England, they came in Germany, they came in France. Annales in der Physik appeared in the period 1790 and 1799. Annales in der Physik is the journal which in 1905 Albert Einstein published his three famous papers. In one issue of, in, of 1905, they were the famous papers on the photoelectric effect, on Brownian motion and relativity. That is what is called the Annus Mirabilis of physics. In 1832, Annalen der Chemie, again a German publication, appeared. And in 1868, Berichte. These are all old journals coming in physics and chemistry from Germany, from England, and also I have not put the French journals here. I have pictured eight journals on this slide. The top row are all the old journals of the 18th and the 19th centuries. The bottom row is the one which shows you the first issue of Nature, 1869. The first issue of the Journal of the American Chemical Society, 1879. Science, 1880. And the Physical Review, 1893. You can see that by the end of the 19th century, the United States of America had begun to enter the picture with the American Chemical Society and the American Physical Society beginning their journals and the American Association for Advancement of Science beginning the journal Science. Today, Nature, Science, the Journal of the American Chemical Society and the Physical Review are among the most important professional journals for scientists all over the world, physicists and chemists in particular. 
But libraries and journals have been connected for a very long time. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to see this paper in Science, October 1927, entitled College Libraries and Chemical Education because at that time chemistry was a very important subject. When I give this talk in the Indian Institute of Science, I must remind you that when the Indian Institute of Science began in 1909, it had only two departments, a department of chemistry and a department of electrical technology. Why was this so? This was because at that time, the two most important things for a country's industrialization were chemicals and power. And therefore, these were the two departments which were actually started. College libraries, therefore, in America had the great need to get journals in physics and chemistry. And the librarians had the problem that they must balance their budgets. So they were given a limited amount of money, and they must now procure all the journals that their faculty and students would want. So in 1927, Gross and Gross pr produced this paper. What they did was they took the Journal of the American Chemical Society and went through all the references in those papers. They asked the question, what did the authors publishing in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, what journals did they cite? And they made this list. You can see the beginnings of what we today call the Science Citation Index in this paper. And right at the top of the list was Berishte. And in the library of the Indian Institute of Science, there are the old volumes of Berishte, but nobody looks at them now because Berishte has actually disappeared. But as you go down, you will see right at the bottom of this list are the journals which are most important today, Science, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. This paper appeared less than a century ago, and you can see how the world of science has transformed in the century. So now we require other journals in the library. Many of the journals on this list, Berishte, Annalen, Annalen der Physik, all of them have now lost their importance or have disappeared. So how has science publishing changed? And what are the factors that have made science publishing change? I've used two words in my title, greed and vanity. Greed, I refer to science publishers. Vanity, I refer to scientists. And I'm going to describe why I do this. On this slide, you'll see a cartoon. And on this cartoon, we are in a corporate office. And the CEO of the company says that it turns out the public hates the culture of corporate greed. And the public does hate the culture of corporate greed. But what is the reaction in the boardroom of a big corporation? They say, let's figure out how we can monetize that hate. That hate has actually been monetized. If we have a hate for paid access journals, they, we have converted to open access journals for which we still pay, except that originally the library is paid, today the author pays, that means the institution pays. I have been on all sides of the academic spectrum. I have been a very poorly paid academic. I have moved up the academic ranks to become the administrator at the top of an institution. I have been an editor of a journal. I have been a referee. I have at one time been also the publisher of current science. So in all of this, it turns out that uh, I've seen everything about scientific publishing. And that is why I'm talking about it to you. In 2010, and I'm quoting here from an article in The Guardian which I've referenced, Stephen Burani says that in 2010, Elsevier's scientific publishing arm reported profits of 724 million pounds on just over 2 billion pounds in revenue. It was a 36% margin, higher than Apple, Google, or Amazon posted that year. And remember that the year 2010, the Western world was just coming out of the Great Recession of 2008. That was when President Obama took office and took office in the midst of a recession. But despite every other industry suffering falling profits, the only industry which stayed profitable is the science publishing industry. This year, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Every industry is suffering. Some industries are actually being wiped out. 
Nevertheless, you will find that the science publishing industry will maintain its margin of about 40% even this year. And you must ask yourself the question, why is this so? Because as librarians, you are the people who are paying the money for everything that we buy from the science publishers. By 2020, even the open access movement has been hijacked to maximize corporate revenues. Pay and publish, both mainstream journals and predatory journals are doing this. Some time ago, a correspondent for the journal Nature uh, asked me over the telephone answers to some questions on open access and predatory journals. One of the questions was that India is a center for predatory journals. What do you think about it? I said, well, there are two kinds of predatory journals. There are predatory journals which are truly predator, predators. And there are other journals which pretend to be respectable, which are also predators, because they're taking away your money and making authors pay for publishing their work. And Nature, the American Chemical Society, many respectable publishers now, the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, all of them now take money for publication. In The Guardian in 2011, I read an article. At that time when I read it, I was really excited because I was then the editor of Current Science and I would have to write an editorial every fortnight. And the title of the article was, Academic Publishers Make Murdoch Look Like a Socialist. Murdoch is Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is still around. He's one of the most important uh, uh, news media owners in the West, in uh, America, in Australia, in England, and so on. And for a while, Murdoch's Macmillan were the pub Murdoch owned Macmillan, and Macmillan were the publishers of Nature. Today, of course, the Nature Publishing Group has been taken over by Springer. And I will read from his article. He asks, who are the most ruthless capitalists in the Western world? Whose monopolistic practices make Walmart look like a corner shop and Rupert Murdoch look like a socialist? You won't guess the answer in a month of Sundays. While there are plenty of candidates, my vote goes not to the banks, the oil companies, or the health insurers, but wait for it, the academic publishers. Theirs might sound like a fusty and insignificant sector. It is anything but. Of all the corporate scams, the racket they run is most urgently in need of referral to the competition authorities. This is a powerful indictment of the academic publishing sector published in 2011. I wrote about it at that time. Nobody read it and everybody still cozies up to the academic publishers. He goes on to say, reading a single article published by one of Elsevier's journals will cost you $31.5. Springer charges 34.9 euros, Wiley Blackwell $42. Read 10 articles and you pay 10 times. And the journals retain perpetual copyright. You want to read a letter printed in 1981, that'll be 31.50. This is what you pay. Fortunately in India, nobody pays and reads. Or I might add sometimes very few people actually read. And they read only what is accessible to them. They don't read what is not accessible. Of course, if you go into a library, and this is in 2011, and in parentheses he adds, if it still exists, they too have been hit by cosmic fees. The average cost of an annual subscription to a chemistry journal is $3,792. Some journals cost $10,000 a year or more to stock. The most expensive I've seen, Elsevier's Biochemica, Biophysica, Acta is $20,930 for the annual subscription. Though academic libraries have been frantically cutting subscriptions to make ends meet, journals now consume 65% of their budget. Now it is probably closer to 90% of their budgets. Except in India, librarians don't bother about this because somebody else gives them the money and they work with the money that they have been given. But what do academic publishers do? They get their articles from authors. The peer review is conducted by other scientists. The editor has also not paid anything. So everything is done, and the material they publish was commissioned and funded, not by the publishers, but by government research grants and academic stipends. But to see it, we must pay again and through the nose. 
And this is because the academic community is not a united community. It is a completely divided and scattered and a leaderless community. The returns are astronomical, he said in 2011. And I've already told you the answer, 36% margin. But Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley, who have bought up many of their competitors, now publish 42% of journal articles. In fact, the only analogy that I can see to this is the rise of Reliance and Reliance Geo, where they are just about monopolizing an entire industry. Monopolies are very dangerous, and that is something that everybody must realize. The publishers claim they have to charge these fees as a result of the costs of production and distribution. There are no more printed journals. Uh, there, uh, there is no cost of production. The author produces on a template everything. You don't even need staff. And much of their editorial work, very little of it, proofreading, is now subcontracted to India. And they pay very little to the people who are working in the Indian companies who are now uh, doing spell checks on the manuscripts which have been accepted for publication. Springer's words, and these are Springer's words, that they develop journal brands and maintain and improve the digital infrastructure which has revolutionized scientific communication in the past 15 years. They've done nothing. Yet the Indian Academy of Sciences, of which I'm a member, has sort of given all its journals to Springer. Fortunately, only the journal that I edited, Current Science, for many years, still remains outside the Springer ambit. It is somewhat ironic sometimes to go to the Springer site to see that you have to pay to read something which is open access somewhere else. There was a study conduct conducted by the Deutsche Bank, and I quote from this article. We be and what the Deutsche Bank report says is this. Believe, we believe the publisher adds relatively little value to the publishing process. If the process really were as complex, costly, and value-added as the publishers protest that it is, 40% margins would not be available. No industry has figured out a way of getting 40% margins, except you have that in science publishing. And then, I'm going to, the rest of it that I'm going to tell you is going to be stories. He goes on to add, Perhaps it's not surprising that one of the biggest crooks ever to have preyed upon the people of this country, he means the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Robert Maxwell made much of his money through academic publishing. He wrote this in 2011. When I read this almost 10 years ago, the first thing I did was immediately go and start reading about Robert Maxwell. When you asked me to give this lecture, I remembered everything that I'd read but today with Google, it is so easy to find everything that you have read several years ago and then document it. And that's what I've done on the subsequent slides. In 2019, again in The Guardian, this is by an author, Carolyn Davis, entitled The Murky Life and Death of Robert Maxwell. And there are some interesting pictures on this slide. You will see that Robert Maxwell was owner of sports clubs, he was the owner of many, many things, and the pictures are illustrative. When he died in 1991, he was right, running a pension fund, and there are the workers out on the streets with posters saying, we was robbed, because their pension funds had disappeared. A description of Maxwell, he rose from impoverishment as a Czechoslovakian refugee to become a decorated war hero during the Second World War, a businessman, a labor member of parliament, then a media mogul amassing private jets, helicopters, and Rolls Royces en route. It sounds almost like Donald Trump. So he was a businessman exactly in the same way, accumulating wealth, power, and political power also on the way. But in 2017, The Guardian had carried another article on asking a question, is the staggeringly profitable business of science publishing bad for science? And today I believe it is. What Maxwell did was, Maxwell was a remarkable man. Whatever you may say, he's a character about whom a movie must be made. The remarkable man, he was a war hero, and in 1950 or 51, 
what he did was he bought a small publishing house which was going out of business. This was a publishing house called Butterworths in England and eventually built from it what is called Pergamon Press. He then realized that scientists have conferences and therefore the best way to get good papers for the journal that you want to start, he had a scientist as a partner, is to go to these conferences. And then once he went to the conferences, he realized what he had to do. He said, scientific conferences tended to be drab, low ceiling affairs. But when Maxwell returned to the Geneva conference that year, he'd attended a conference in Geneva the previous year, he went back the next year. He rented a house in nearby Cologne, Belarif, a picturesque town on the lake shore, where he entertained guests at parties with booze, cigars, and sailboat trips. Scientists had never seen anything like him. He always said, we don't compete on sales, we compete on authors. Albert Henderson, a former director at Pergamon, told the author of this article, we would attend conferences specifically looking to recruit editors for new journals. There are tales of parties on the roof of the Athens Hilton, of gifts of Concorde flights across the Atlantic, flights of scientists being put on a chartered boat tour of the Greek islands to plan their new journal. In later years, Elsevier and many of these major publishing houses have had conferences for librarians in exotic locations in order to bring librarians on their side while they pay astronomical charges for their journals. Maxwell noted in 1988, after he'd become very successful, scientists are not as price conscious as other professionals, mainly because they are not spending their own money. In 1991, in order to finance his impending purchase of the New York Daily News, Maxwell sold Pergamon to its quiet Dutch competitor. Who was this quiet Dutch competitor? That was Elsevier. He sold Pergamon Press to Elsevier for $440 million. And as you will see on my next slide, he had purchased Butterworths in 1951 for 13,000 pounds. He sold it for 440 million pounds. He was truly an entrepreneur whom we must celebrate because he understood something. He called science a perpetual financing machine. And uh, on the right hand side of the, on the left hand side, you see Robert Maxwell, a larger than life figure. On the right hand side, you see the journal Tetrahedron Letters, a journal of organic chemistry, which I used to look at when I was a young student. It started in the 1960s. It has as its two editors, two of the most celebrated organic chemists of the 20th century, Alexander Todd, who won a Nobel Prize, and Robert Woodward, who not only won a Nobel Prize, was, was, but was more or less celebrated as the high priest of organic chemistry. These were the founding editors for his journal. He had hosted, wined, and dined them, and got their names onto his journal. He later on bought castles in England and entertained the most important scientists of the world. He then produced letters journals. He said, scientists like to produce. So if I had the journal Tetrahedron, let me produce Tetrahedron letters. He introduced photo offset printing. So the author did the typing, author did everything. All you did was photograph it and print it again. This was now a perpetual money-making machine. He then expanded the letters journals to every field of science. And therefore, he invented what I will describe on the next slide. But right at the bottom of the slide, I show you a paper in tetrahedron letters, written by one of the most important chemists of the 20th century, Carl Gerasi. The title of the paper I will read you. It's a technical paper. Novel Magnetic Circular Dichroism Spectra of Monoacetyl Porphyrins, Structural Implications. Who is it dedicated to? It's dedicated to Robert Maxwell, founder and publisher of Pergamon Press on the occasion of his 60th birthday. So here we have one of the most important scientists of the 20th century, the man who actually was behind the work on steroids which led to the oral contraceptive pill, Carl Gerasi now writing, dedicating a paper to the publisher Robert Maxwell. Robert Maxwell died in mysterious circumstances in 1991. He was on his yacht when he fell overboard and drowned. 
The story still goes around. Was he drowned or was he murdered? Did somebody push him overboard? What was he really? Among, he had very good connections in Israel because his funeral was attended by the then president of Israel and the prime minister of Israel. The question was, was he a spy for the Israeli secret service, Mossad? So here was a man about whom we must read because this is the kind of life that one must celebrate because it illustrates the kind of ingenuity that humans can really have. But I show you on this slide how science publishers are being checkmated. They are being checkmated by a young girl, a student doing her PhD in Kazakhstan, Alexander El Bakyan. And what she's done is she has produced this website, SciHub, a portal where you can actually download just about anything. Mon Bio writing again in The Guardian in 2018 calls El Alexandra El Bakyan's service, a pirate web scraper service, has done more than any government to tackle one of the biggest ripoffs of the modern era the capture of publicly funded research that should belong to us all. Everyone should be free to learn. Knowledge should be disseminated as widely as possible. No one would publicly disagree with these sentiments. And here is the most important sentence. Yet governments and universities have allowed the big academic publishers to deny these rights. Now I come to the second word that I used in my title, vanity. How do you describe vanity? I've put a picture on this slide. You will all remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And there, the wicked queen in Snow White will look in the mirror and ask, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror will always answer, thou, O queen, art the fairest in the land. But then one day, the mirror will tell her, Snow White, O queen, is the fairest of them all. And thus, the story will begin. The queen was vain, so are scientists. On the left of the slide, I picture a journal, a modern journal, which is probably the most celebrated journal in biology today, the journal Cell. The journal Cell was started by MIT Press in 1974. It was started by a wonderful scientist, Benjamin Levin. And Benjamin Levin, was a very interesting person. Not only did he start this journal, but he recognized something like Rupert Murdoch. He recognized something that is needed. R Murdoch introduced letters journals. Levin now realized that we must have a journal in which if you publish a paper, you publish only one paper. The paper is a totally complete paper. It may take many, many years to write, but it is a complete paper. I quote now. And this uh, is a quotation from an article, again, to which I've referenced in The Guardian. And the quotation is from a Nobel laureate biologist, Randy Shekman. And what Shekman says is this, Levin was clever. He realized scientists are very vain. So did Murdoch. Murdoch also realized that scientists are vain, and he sort of got the most important scientists and plied them with various things. He said, scientists are very vain and want to be part of a very selective club. And therefore, he created a journal in which you can be a very member of a very selective club if you publish in that journal. And you had to get your paper into cell. Shekman says, I too was subjected to this kind of pressure. He ended up publishing some of his Nobel cited work in cell. In 1986, Shekman created Cell Press. And in 1999, Cell Press was acquired by Elsevier. From 1999, Indian biologists began to recognize Cell as a very important journal. And today, Cell is the most celebrated journal among Indian biologists. But I will also give you another reference on this slide. It's by a very famous biologist, Solomon Snyder the man who discovered the opiate receptor in the brain and the endogenous antagonist for the opiate receptor. Solomon Snyder's article has, is, has a very interesting title, Science Interminable, Blame Ben, and a question mark. What did Ben do? Ben exhorted authors to refrain from publication until they had completed their stories, the exact opposite of Maxwell. 
He recruited the leading molecular biologists of the day as authors. Exactly the same thing that Maxwell had done, recruiting the most important scientists to his side, advocating that they publish in his journal the best of their research. Once the most important scientists have published in a journal, all the new upcoming scientists will also like to publish in the journal, because then only do they get peer recognition. This is where vanity drives scientists and the need to belong to exclusive clubs. So what did Maxwell give us in science publishing? He also gave us what I call the least publishable unit. This is not my term, but is a term which I heard many, many years ago when I was young. Tetrahedral letters is an example, but there are many other letters journals which are present. Then came cell press. What did Levin give us? What did Benjamin Levin give us? He gave us a deluge of data and a complete story. He introduced the word story into the common language of biology. Today I hear young biologists saying that they would like to complete a story. Sometimes when I hear the word story, I always think of fiction. Therefore one must be aware of the kind of pressures that there are to complete stories, to completely prove hypotheses which may not be strictly proven by experimental data, and which is why today the scientific literature in biology and many other very rapidly advancing fields has run into so much trouble. But when we talk about journals, we ask some very simple questions. Who produces journals? Publishers, editors, authors. Who should pay for journals to survive? Readers? That's what libraries were doing all the while. And authors, open access and research grants. Now if you analyze the situation today carefully, you're paying both ways. The institution pays its faculty to uh, give open access, or the government, to pay open access charges. The library continues to pay Elsevier for bundled journals, uh, pay Springer for bundled journals, pay Wiley for bundled journals. When you get bundled journals, when you get 1,000 bundled journals, do you think anybody reads 1,000 journals? Nobody. If the library conducted a survey on how many journals their readers read, and that was done at the Indian Institute of Science many, many years ago, you will find that they read very few journals. They don't read most of the journals. How many journals do they cite? They cite very few journals. Certainly not a thousand. How much profit should the commercial publishers make? We ask this question of pharmaceutical industry. How much profit should a pharmaceutical industry make? Tomorrow, if a COVID vaccine comes or a COVID therapeutic comes, you don't want to pay $1,000 to get a vaccine. No. You would like to get it cheap. If possible, you'd like to get it free. Publishers exploit human weakness and the vanity of scientists. But what has now given scientists an opportunity to become even more vain than they were? On this slide, I show you the beginnings of scientometrics, because you're also a society for library and information science. And information science, at least in the eyes of librarians, has been associated with scientometrics. Actually, information science is more a branch of computer science than of library science. Eugene Garfield, who died a short while ago, introduced current contents many years ago. He also introduced the citation indexes for science in a wonderful paper published in Science in 1955, which I've referenced here. He calls this, he says, this new bibliographic tool like others that already exist is just a starting point in literature research. It will help in many ways, but one should not expect it to solve all our problems. He intended the Science Citation Index to be a tool for literature research just the way the 1927 librarians Gross and Gross had anticipated. Current content was a wonderful way of bringing a digest of journals very quickly before the journals arrived. And in this very library where I'm giving this lecture, I used to come every Thursday to read current contents. I would come a bit early because there would be one or two senior professors who would beat me to it. And once a senior professor had got hold of it, you could never get it back. So one would try to be the first person to get current contents. Current contents used to be kept below the circulation desk. So you had to sign on a sheet in order to take it, and you have to sign when you returned it. When the Science Citation Index was first proposed, its major objective was to break the so-called subject index barrier. These are Garfield's words. 
out of this bibliographic experiment has evolved a historiographic and sociometric tool of major importance. Like most scientific discoveries, and Garfield's was a scientific discovery, this tool can be used wisely or abused. It is now up to the scientific community to prevent abuse of the science citation index by devoting the necessary attention to its proper and judicious exploitation. He said this in 1970 in an article in Nature. All that the scientific community, especially in developing countries and more specifically in India does, it abuses the science citation index. It does not use it. Using the science citation index and using what he called historiographic and sociometric tools, Garfield was able to build networks of how science has progressed. That is how he discovered an unknown Indian scientist, Sambunath Day, who discovered the cholera enterotoxin and made one of the major breakthroughs of the 20th century in the study of cholera. But Day was a forgotten scientist whom Garfield discovered through his analysis. So this is an example of a discovery made of relevance to India by the Science Citation Index. Garfield later on did other analysis where he looked at all the papers and asked how many times are they cited. And he found that most of the papers in the scientific literature, and I show you one of the papers that he wrote, uh, this appeared probably somewhere in the late 1980s, uh, 1988 or so, where he had citation frequencies and distributions of papers. And when you look at this, there are only 20 papers which have more than 10,000 citations at that time. These are like, if you look at the batting statistics, you will find very few people have got as many runs as Tendulkar. If you go beyond 10,000 runs in test matches, you will find very few people. And uh, that's exactly what this is, counting. He found that most of the papers in the literature were never cited. And if they were never cited, they were not even cited by the author who wrote them in a second paper. And this was interesting. He redid this again, taking data from 2005, which I show him on this slide. And this is again very, very interesting because he found that a very large number of papers in the database of the Web of Science were not cited or were cited very few times. Greater than 10,000 accounted to 0.0% of the literature because you have to go to the third decimal place or the fourth decimal place to find out what is 10,000 because it, it is 10,000 out of more than 38 million items, a very, very small number. Nature, in the year 2014, had this interesting picture which I show on the slide. It's called the paper mountain. If you take the first page of every published scientific article and put it and stack it up, the height of that will be approximately 6,000 meters. It's only the first page. And uh, 6,000 meters is the height of Mount Kilimanjaro. And therefore they said this is the paper mountain. What's at the top of the paper mountain? These are the most cited papers in the scientific literature. And these papers are very, very few. And if you look at my slide, you will find that Hardly, a very, very small fraction of papers are hugely cited. Most papers have never been cited in the literature. This was with a much larger database than what Garfield used. We now have many. We have the Scopus database, which is Elsevier's. We have the Web of Science database, which is now with Clarivet. And uh, we have the Google Scholar rankings, uh, nature does its own with nature publishing group journals and scientists are enamored by all of this, especially if they see their own names on it, one of them. And uh, Google Scholar rankings I show you, they're different. But Google Scholar will have some commonalities with the best ones in nature's mountains and so on. And that you have to look at slides in order carefully in order to do this. The purpose of this lecture is only to give you the slides and give you the material and you can actually digest it yourself and analyze it in your own way. But you will find some papers are missing. They're not there in the web of science analysis. They're not there in the Scopus analysis, but they'll be in the Google Scholar analysis. And I've highlighted in red only one on the slide. That is Claude Shannon's very famous paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which appeared in the Bell Systems Technology Journal, a journal of the Bell Telephone Laboratories where he was then working. 
Now, this was actually the first shot of the information technology revolution. But of course, it is not the most cited paper in... Uh... But why are there so many papers? Why do scientists publish so many papers? Garfield said this very well, again in the 1970s. He used to write wonderful essays, two pages, very small pages, in current contents every week. And I used to come to this very same uh, location and read them every Thursday. That's the first thing I would read, what he wrote. He says, the growth of science is dependent upon an accumulation of many, and in quotes, mediocre results that are produced by hard work. Long live the mediocrities. Without them, how could they be geniuses? So this is something that you might all well think about. Our own library and information science professionals Muthu Madan and Subhaya Arunachalam and their colleague G. Chandrasekhar have published a paper in Current Science in 2010 where they talk about the increasing number of papers from India. They say it is heartening is that the production of research papers is increasing in India and even more so in China. The next step is for researchers in the two countries to write papers that will be cited far more often than now. As and then they quote from Chairman Mao. I think at the beginning, in our introduction, we heard a, a quotation from Confucius. Now you will hear a quotation from another famous Chinese, Chairman Mao. What Chairman Mao said is apparently this, every quality manifests itself in a certain quantity, and without quantity, there can be no quality. And this is the justification for scientists to publish more papers. And it's a reasonable justification because we need to have a lot of papers be before we have high quality papers. But in changing the landscape of science, science publishing has changed it. But the way science publishing is used has also changed it. This picture shows you the former president of India, President Pranab Mukherjee, and the title of this news item, and I show his picture here, takes a strong interest in India's performance in university rankings. Those of you who have been in universities, some of you I know even in this audience here, are vice chancellors. And you're always asked, what, are, what is the ranking of your university? I used to be asked this question every time I was at the Indian Institute of Science. And you will find that the university ranking systems are also being driven by corporate interests. This is now of what I would call a confluence of corporate interests in science publishing and in science rankings and in institutional rankings. If you look at these pictures very carefully, you will see the corporate hand in the people who are pictured on this. This slide shows you how the World University Rankings, which is done by the Times Higher Education Group, is done, and their scoring methodologies. They will, of course, have 30% of marks for research, and the only way research is judged is by publications. The number of publications, the journals in which they have been published, and how much they have been cited. So universities now need to invest in publications, 30%, if they want to go up in the ranking. Of course, every university is investing, so it will turn out that no university will go up in the rankings, at least in India. This slide shows you a comparison of university rankings of 2020. QS, Times Higher Education, the uh, academic rankings of world universities, which are called the Shanghai rankings. And all of these you can see, and you will need to see the slides carefully to look at them. You will find the top Indian institutions in these. They are not making much progress. And in some of the university world rankings, they will actually be going down. This is because the corporate interests have now made all universities now play the game of improving their rankings. So everybody is going to be improving their rankings and investing money. How are they going to, where are they going to spend the money? They're going to give money to these companies which are going to tell you how to improve your rankings, how to brand yourself. And eventually, the world of academia will become a marketing exercise in which we pay the maximum amount of money to marketing professionals and not to those who actually made the product. India has now invested under political pressure its own rankings, the National Institutional Ranking Framework, or what are called NIRF rankings, and I'll show you those. Now, I don't see why every Indian institution must be competing with itself. 
I think everybody knows when an institution is doing well or badly. If the head of the institution cannot make an academic judgment of how their institutions are doing, you don't need a company to tell you how it's doing. State governments now pay money. Central institutions pay money to companies which tell them how to improve their rankings and how to produce data for these rankings. There's an obsession with metrics. And this obsession with metrics is indicated on the slide with a paper which has just appeared in 2020. The paper is entitled, Updated Science-Wide Author Databases of Standardized Citation Indicators. It comes from Stanford University. And therefore, in India, it will be vested with a very high uh, reputation because it comes from Stanford University. In Stanford University itself, nobody will give a second look at this paper. This appears in the journal PLOS Biology, which all biologists like. But you should see a formula for calculating the career-long impact of scientists. They define a parameter C. And I show you the equation which they've used. The moment you see this equation which, you've been, which they're using, you should then decide, let's not look at this anymore. That, of course, is left to your judgment. You should now not use this career impact and go around and look at your, career, your colleague and say, my career impact is more than yours. It doesn't make any sense at all. The tyranny of metrics, of measurement of academic quality must be recognized. This is what has led to the growth of predatory journals and predatory conferences. This is correlated to publication requirements for PhD thesis submission and use of API scores for faculty evaluation in Indian universities. The academic performance index should be scrapped. The requirement for publication should be scrapped because institutions must know when a student has done enough, enough work for a PhD. Otherwise, they will publish in predatory journals. They will plagiarize. They will do all kinds of things. If institutions cannot recognize quality, who else will recognize quality? Awards and rewards committees rely excessively on impact factors and citation metrics in the sciences. This is why today when you see some very celebrated scientists, you wonder what are they being celebrated for when you hear them speak about their own work. And this is a worry. Informed personal judgments are no longer available, nor are they acceptable. Because we have now decided that everybody is corrupt, intellectually also corrupt, and therefore we must have some objective criteria. There are many academic issues of concern to academic institutions and the University Grants Commission. There are problems and there are solutions. I indicate them on this slide. I know the problems, but I don't believe the solutions are the right solutions. If you have plagiarism, UGC and MHRD will tell you, use Turnitin. Use a software to decide whether there's been plagiarism. This is not right. This is not going to work. It's easy to fool software once you know how to fool it. Predatory fraudulent journals, UGC approved lists of care UGC cannot go on approving lists. They'll spend all their time approving lists because predatory journals can be produced today in a day. It's easy to set up a web portal. And all you have to do is to go to the omic sites to see how many journals they run without an office, without uh, anything. The virtual world allows you to now have scams on an unbelievable scale. Data fraud, investigation and punishment is what is the solution. But to investigate and punish takes a long time. What it is, is, and I show you on this slide, and I'm coming more or less to the end of my presentation. I show you a cartoon of mine, a favorite cartoon. It's on the cover of R.K. Lakshman's book, which is called The Very Best of the Common Man, where is a compilation of Lakshman's cartoons. But there you have the common man, and very often in Lakshman's cartoons, if you look at the common man, he's bewildered. He's puzzled by what he sees around. And in India, you can always be puzzled by what you see around you. In the academic sphere, when we talk about all these problems, one actually wonders, is it a lack of integrity or is it just bewildering ignorance? My suspicion is that in many places, 
it might not be a lack of integrity, it might actually just be bewildering ignorance on the part of students, bewildering ignorance on the part of faculty, and these sorts of uh, problems never having been discussed openly and in a scholarly way. And this more or less is my last slide. I have two more after this, I guess. What is the future of library science and information science as perceived by librarians in India. I have used the word rather carefully. I said information science as perceived by librarians because I don't believe that the perception of, library, of information science as perceived by librarians is information science at all. Library science, yes. It's the information which is there in libraries. I put question marks, not one, but three. There's the growing irrelevance of journals as custodians of quality and aggregators of papers. The ever-expanding scope of digital media. The expanding open archive repositories which have now appeared. Physics was first. Biology came many years later. Chemistry, which is the most conservative, has come. So you now have open archives in three major disciplines of science and these now expand to everything else. So once these open archive repositories are there, and we have uh, large numbers of private sites which will crop up, I'm sure, in the future, which allow you to break the locks which publishers put on digital data. The way people get information is going to change. The need for re-evaluation of courses in library and information science. What are you teaching the people who now get degrees in library science? I think this is very important. Library science is not what it was. 30 years ago. It's not what it was 50 years ago. It's not important now to really teach other than in a historical sense what were Ranganathan's contributions. Classification has disappeared. The need for appreciation of the role of libraries as archives of institutional records is something that one must appreciate. Even an old institution like the Indian Institute of Science in which I've spent much of my academic career, has completely failed to appreciate the need to have very good archival and institutional records. Especially when you go back in time, it is very difficult to find those records again. And thereby we lose much of our history. Library science, I believe, is at the crossroads. It's at the crossroads where it has to decide where it should go. And that is what I think academies like the LIS Academy should be doing, debating on this internally and then getting people from outside to now contribute to this discussion. But I've used a picture here, and this is a picture from Alice in Wonderland. And in Alice in Wonderland, you will find that Alice is going along a road and then suddenly she, she comes to the place where the road simply is at a fork. And at the fork there will be a tree. And on the tree, sitting there, is the Cheshire cat. The Cheshire cat will have a white smile on its face. In fact, at times what will happen is the Cheshire cat will disappear, only the smile will remain. So she comes to this and asks the cat, and she tells the cat, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? The cat is a very intelligent cat. The cat says that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice's answer is typically the kind of answer that we might make. I don't much care where. I just want to go somewhere. Then the cat is very clever. Cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. You'll go somewhere. Uh, Alice adds as an explanation so long as I get somewhere. And the cat says, oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. Now, actually, I suspect in library science and in many other disciplines which we teach in our universities, we have not changed our teaching, we have not changed our curricula, we have not modified our syllabi, we have not changed our teaching methods, although the pandemic has given us some cause to think and reflect. We need to do this. Otherwise, we're just going along and we're going somewhere. And that somewhere, I suspect, is actually going to lead us nowhere. 
On my last slide is my acknowledgement slide. And on this, I acknowledge the two institutions where I have spent almost my entire academic career. On the top left is the Indian Institute of Science, where I have spent 41 years until I retired. And uh, the most wonderful place that I've seen. And on the bottom right is the National Center for Biological Sciences, which has provided me a home for the last few years and where I've had the opportunity to think about many things and also learn many new aspects of the discipline of biology. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hope your seminar series will be an extraordinarily successful one. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much for your intellectual discourse. I am sure the academic, research and library professionals have highly benefited by your talk. Now, I request Professor Kempraju, a Honorable Vice Chancellor of Bangalore North University, Kola, to deliver his presidential remarks. Hello, uh, Namaskara. Professor Balaram, the very distinguished chief guest of this occasion, and who has delivered our first monthly lecture on science publishing, greed, vanity, and decline of scholarship, Professor Kurnur, Dr. Anand, Dr. Meera, Dr. Shuram, my learned professional colleagues, invitees, media persons, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you once again as the president of this, uh, the committee on organizing the monthly lecture series under LISA for this virtual gathering to witness the inauguration of the first lecture program which was delivered by Professor Balaram. In fact, it is one of the good initiatives taken by the governing council of uh, the LISA. And this first monthly program has been organizing today in a very auspicious situation of National Library Week. Ladies and gentlemen, we all of us know that education and development, these are the two important components for any national or social progress and prosperity. Today, all countries are striving very hard to achieve progress and development in all spectrum of human activities. So development is possible mainly because of the good quality education and also for good quality research. The libraries and information centers are playing a very important role in supporting all the developmental programs of all the institutions by giving right and timely access to information to all the stakeholders of that organization. We are all living in a changing environment. It doesn't mean that uh, changing environment is witnessing only now because of COVID or Corona, because the changing scenario in which we are all witnessing is from several years. Society is changing, global changes are happening, and also changes are happening in every field of activities. Accordingly, the libraries are also changing. Why libraries are changing? Because users are changing, their changes, their needs are changing, their requirements are changing, the technologies are changing, and also there is a changes in the physical and intellectual characters of the knowledge resources. The libraries are the most trusted sources of information because no other agency or institution can substitute to the world libraries. Only the library can be called as the trusted source of information. So libraries are the librarians in which we are all working. Our ultimate focus and our ultimate target is our users. So users are our essential requirements 
where our main objective is to meet their needs and requirements. In the meanwhile, to strengthen our library activities or initiatives or information services, it is not only just enough to give an access to information or they deliver our information and information resources and services. Equally important is to get their feedback about our services, our resources, and other facilities to what extent they are all meeting. That is one point. And the second point, it is very essential for the librarians not only to learn our own subject, not only to listen to our own professional colleagues in library science alone, but it is equally important to listen to the other people, other subjects, other scientists, so that we can understand the growth or changes are happening in various subject dimensions are important. So that is the very reason why the initiative taken by the LISA for organizing the monthly lecture series by calling or inviting the eminent scientists, eminent scholars, or administrators in other fields so who have extensively used the library and contributed very significantly to their own respective field of activities. So our greatest resource person who has delivered the lect first lecture is par excellence and he is the great user of our libraries. Professor Balaram, during his 60 minutes of his scholarly presentation, has identified very vital issues focusing on the title of his presentation, which is directly towards the greed for publishing, vanity in publishing, and equally, another negative trend is declining scholarship. What he mentioned about the importance of communication, which has started through letters, that is the first statement what he has made in his uh, beginning of his lecture. Libraries are the one of the communication centers. We used to communicate. Communication means transfer of information. We used to communicate to our users through our catalog, through our notifications, through our classification numbers, through our services, etc., and etc. So, the changes in communication process because of the developments of technologies has further made an impact on a communication system. That is what uh, Professor Barlam said is that the advent of internet, the entry of internet, and also the use of internet has changed the culture of our communication system. So, Libraries as a communication centers, to reach our users, we are extensively using the internet, email, and such other social medias for reaching our users to meet their needs and requirements. He also stressed upon the growth of publishing, scientific publishing, which is, as I said, that 16th century's philosophical transactions, that is the early period of the growth of journals. He has narrated extensively the historical growth of the periodical publications. So periodicals or the journals, what I mentioned, is closely related to the development. So any development, any progress, or any achievement is first is reported through these periodical publications. It is not only in science, even in the social sciences also, it is reported in the primary resources to the make known to the world what we have achieved in different fields of activities. So that research and journals is inseparable. No research without the support of journals, and no growth of journals without the support of research. So that these two aspects has to go. That is why even in libraries, mainly in science and technology libraries, the larger percentage of our budget is always spending more on the primary resources majorly the periodical publications as well as the journal publications. So, because of the policy decisions of the institutions as well as the government, the librarians are struggling very hard to balance the budget for the allocation of for the journals. That is what uh, Professor Balram has rightly mentioned. The secondly, also mentioned about the changes in the scientific publishing. 
So there is a corporate greed, that's what he has rightly mentioned. And also there is a changes in the payment mode. The libraries are paying for subscription, and it's also the authors are paying for publication, and also users also has to pay for usage of these kinds of literature or the journals. So that the scientific publishing is industry, in spite of this uh, today's problem, there is a remarkable growth of not less than 40%. That is what the, one of the important observations. Though many of the industries have been perished or not uh, effectively functioning, but one of the positive trend in this corona period or in this uh, COVID period is the scientific publishing industry as achieving a satisfactory level of this. This is what one of the important uh, point, Professor Balram sir, has uh, rightly been pointed out. But today, one of the important uh, factors where we are library and information professionals has to take note of because of the changing nature of the both the publishing of the journals and also the policy and methods of subscription of the journals, and also changes in the methods of usage of the journals. And we have to think in the direction of how effectively the public tax, where we are spending a lot on this periodical publishing, has to be effectively changed. So changing shift is pay and publish, changes for the use of the library source. So 90% of the budget in many of the scientific libraries, because when you look at our uh, student dissertations or a PhD thesis, when they are reporting on uh, the institutional profiles about the, what is the budget total, how much is for books, how much is for periodicals, how much for other things, in many of the inst scientific institutions, 90% of the uh, budget is earmarked for the li journals. So that speaks about how journals play a very important role, both for the research and developmental programs. So Balram sir has rightly pointed out once again to need to re-examine. The time has come to re-examine the negotiation models in the subscription of the periodical publications. So there is a good margin in many of these uh, models are concerned, but the librarians has to put an extra effort. They have to re-examine the strategies and methods of so it is possible, all these things are possible, or the librarian can become a successful negotiator provided if he knows about the scientific publishing industry and also the scientific publishing business and such other kinds of the strategies. So that is why there is no investment on printing today, there is no investment of paper today, there is no investment of postage today. So earlier in the print publishing industries, all these type of uh, the costs were there, production costs were there, but technology has eased out or lessened or reduced to a larger extent all these type of production costs. So these are all a lot of opportunities for this and equally there is a lot of complexities also. We the librarians has to take note of all these kinds of things with the, uh, with the publishers and such other kinds of things. And another important thing what uh, Professor Balram sir has pointed out, the institutional image or the organizational image of the universities or so, is also depends on its intellectual productivity. Okay. So NRIF, National Institution Ranking Framework, what the government of India has drawn in to identify the rankings. Okay. So one of the things what I want to mention here, we all of us know that Though India has achieved its independence in 1947, and we enjoyed our Indian independence more than seven decades, but till today, not even a single university has figured in the top 100 universities of the world. So though India has made a remarkable progress and achievement in various scientific and technological front, but in the field of higher education and research, though we have to do a lot more things. So there is a, Vanity drive among the scientists. This is one of the visible concepts in the research front. And the importance of scientific literature is very, very important to drive towards positive thinking in the research is concerned. And also survival of journal publishing. 
This is also based on the, the payment, profit of publishing industry, and profit of publishing exploitation in various scientists. That's what the points observed by uh, Professor Balram. And a lot of uh, such kind of an issues. He also mentioned about the role and also importance of these global databases and changes happening in the ranking of the scientific journals and such other kind of issues. So to conclude about my presidential remarks on this occasion, so three important issues what he raised to discuss about the future of library and information science. One is, though it is outside the domain of LIS education, what I mentioned about critical issue, that is the quality of journals. Okay. So number of journals publishing from India, their quality, their ranking in the world ranking. And also open archives movement. And also mentioned about the need for evaluation of library and information science courses. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be very cautious. Our users are telling about our library science course programs are concerned. Somewhere our users have identified that certain things are missing with our library and information science graduates. Because the author, what uh, the presentation has made, so he is the head of this greatest institution of Indian Institute of Science. He has observed in several interview committees while selecting the librarians, while appointing the librarians, or interacting with the librarians, or understanding their perception of understanding ability of librarians, and also the working ability of the librarians. I personally feel that based on that, he has made this kind of a observation or a remark that there is a need for re-evaluation of library and information science courses and to meet the changing job market. It is one of the points in which the library and information science schools has to take note of it. So this kind of a thing which you are already deliberating. So a lot of discussion is going on about our education system. So still we have yet to find an answer about how far our education system is relevant today. So the National Education Policy 2020, just now which is released by the government of India, still now in the public domain to elicit the opinion of our stakeholders. I think library and information science education also has to take note of all these things. So otherwise, so the, it is very difficult to retain our identity, our role. And there is a threat once again what here and there we have to we have observed that people of other profession they prove that they are better than librarians though they are not having the qualification of librarian they may occupy our positions it is a time now it is a good uh, a kind of a warning bell by professor balram sir has said the librarian information science schools has to take note of this and another important uh, point what he mentioned is that there's a need for appreciate the efforts of the librarians. So you look at his uh, perception. On the one side, he says that there is a need to redefine, re-examine the training of library and information science. On the other side, we have to appreciate the work or the services rendered by the librarians. So we have to be thankful to him. But in the meanwhile, the library and information science has to get up to meet that kind of an occasion. And very catchy word, what he said. So what is the travel or the journey of library science education and the librarianship in India today? I think based on his remorse, we all used to discuss in our vice chancellor's forum about the air education in the crossroad or education in the crossroad. Similarly, library and information science is also in the crossroads, okay? I think which road we have to continue our journey, which is the right road, and which is the successful path. I think all these issues where the, our profession has to take care of it. And we know that there's a lot of scope is there, a lot of opportunities are there, but in the meanwhile, 
There's a lot of threat is there. So one side our subject is growing. It is flourishing. But the other side, somewhere in the Indian librarianship, is we are witnessing a lot of missing points. The role to be played by our library associations. Once again, we have to redefine the role of our national library associations or the state library associations. And also the role of our LIS leaders. Okay. So here we are finding a kind of a big vacuum of identifying the, our professional leaders who own us a lot of responsibility to guide our younger generation, younger librarians, budding librarians, and also in that line, somewhere there is a gap is there. This gap has to be minimized. This gap has to be filled. I, that is how in the coming days. So technology has given a lot of opportunities for us. Technology has helped for libraries in many ways, but our professional identity, our image, as well as our existence is also other challenging issues. And we have to take note of all the propositions given by Professor Balram. So this presentation is not only restricted towards scientific publication, but also his insights, his thoughts are also very valid for our professional growth. So I personally, and also on behalf of Lisa, I thankful to Professor Balram for accepting the, our request to be the first resource person to deliver the monthly lecture series. I think we have kick-started this program with the right person on the right day, that is called National Library Week, and we hope that we have to carry forward a lot more such kind of an initiatives for the progress and prosperity of our profession. So i thankful to Professor Kwanur and other uh, committee members for initiating this kind of a program. And uh, I wish these coming programs are also a great success on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind presidential remarks to the LIS professionals. Thank you very much. I once again thank uh, today's speaker and uh, president of today's uh, inaugural lecture, uh, uh, Professor Kempraju and uh, Professor Balram sir, for their excellent remarks on uh, science publishing and the uh, role of uh, library and library science uh, profession in coming years. Now uh, uh, it's open for a discussion. Uh, as you are witnessing our chat box, there are a lot of questions are pouring in. So there are two participants who are online to ask question. Uh, Dr. Nagapa Bakran Nawar, uh, who is an AGM in Tata Consultancy Service, and he has got a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Nagapa, please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Balram, sir. Uh, my first question is uh, goes like this: How to control uh, publishing a paper, writing a paper today, and publishing yesterday? I'm not sure I get your meaning, but. I suspect sometimes in Indian journals what kind of problem has arisen because the date of publication of the journal is very often very delayed. And therefore sometimes things have uh, appeared in journals. Uh, the, the submission date is after the publication date of the journal. But that I think is only a clerical problem, which I think more or less has been sorted out for many good journals today. This is what I understood from your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, if Shivram permits, I have another question. What causes the Indian research publications uh, to be rejected by or being rejected by global journals? What are the causes? No, I think. Causes of rejection in publications are invariably because editors and referees do not think that the paper merits publication. See, every piece of research does not necessarily merit publication. But this judgment is to be made by editors. It's the judgment is to be made by referees. So that is uh, been going on now for, for a very long time. Authors feel very unhappy when their work is rejected, but eventually people do find another journal in which they can publish their work. Yeah, I think Satya wants to comment. 
Satya, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Balram, uh, it's so nice to see you virtually. It's always a delight to you know, hear you. Such a wonderful lecture. I have something to add to the Robert Mann. Uh, Dr. Garfield uh, got uh, strangely you know, uh, connected in a very interesting way. You know, uh, this is something uh, I was told by one uh, 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 professor uh, Jean Claude Jean, who is an advocate of uh, uh, open access, which is also confirmed by Dr. Garfield himself, whom I met him about uh, a few years ago. You know, the story is like this uh, Robert Maxwell wanted to buy science citation index in Garfield, uh, the whole ISI at the time. And uh, yeah. Garfield made it very clear to Robert Maxwell, sorry, I can't give you any time. And uh, Robert Maxwell, I believe, threatened him. And Garfield told him very clearly, look, you will never get it as long as I'm heading ISI. And, you know, it's further a story that uh, Robert, Ma you, you told that Robert Maxwell sold off for the month to elsewhere. And, uh, elsewhere subsequently came out uh, recently about uh, 15 years ago with scopus one of the reasons why garfield did not want to sell this uh, science citation index to robert maxwell or any publisher he very strongly believed that a citation product should be always a neutral one since it is an analysis of the performance of the science journals and that was the primary reason why he refused to sell. But interestingly, elsewhere with Bart Argoman finally realized the goal of um, Robert Maxwell to come, coming out with focus. Now, my question is regard is, you know, a, a metrics product like citation index should be always a neutral product. Why scientific community did not react to a, a, a product like Scopus coming from publisher and not from a neutral agent. Uh, another question I have is in this regard, you put very well the greed and the vanity of greed of the publishers and the vanity of uh, um, author have contributed to the kind of situation is like in general today, uh, giving very high values to the publishers. Now uh, that is well understood. But if you look at it, in this whole uh, drama, uh, the partners of the learned societies who over a period of time we just sold away to their government to Elspeth and the Springers, etc. Or they assigned their copyright to, uh, to make them co-publishers. And uh, authors, as you know, continue to give away the exclusive copyright to publishers, creating inner demand. So in this scenario, don't you think that society and authors are in some way partners in the crime publishers continue to commit in, the, uh, in, in today's story of scientific journal publishing with very high, unusually very high profits of 40%? Uh, yes, you see, I'll, I'll address Scopus first. I think one of the reasons why the scientific community uh, doesn't seem to worry about Scopus being in the hands of Elsevier is I think large sections of the scientific community, at least in India, does not understand uh, this issue at all. Right now, everybody likes Scopus as a database because they include more and more journals. The web of science is a little bit more of a restricted database. But I think it's quite possible for scientists to make their own databases now of journals they would like to see and analyze uh, available literature. But this other thing that you said about scientific societies, this is true because most scientific societies in European countries and other, even in Japan, China and so on, uh, were running into financial difficulties in publishing their journals. So I think these co-publishing agreements are allowing uh, uh, corporate publishers to take over seem to be the way to go. 
But if you look at big academic publishers now, like the American Chemical Society, they are also corporate in their own way. In order to keep their journals afloat, afloat uh, they are doing quite a lot of uh, the kinds of things that uh, corporate publishers also do. Uh, Indian societies, of course, is different. There was a question I saw in the chat box of why, for example, the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, gave its journals to Springer for co-publishing. At that time, it, uh, sometime I think in the late 90s or early 2000s, uh, all the publishers came forward, uh, Elsevier, Springer, and the Nature Publishing Group. So they all made presentations. And what they had to offer really was this, that your journals will become more visible internationally and your impact factors will go up. Uh, many people, I think, felt that uh, this is what they wanted because you would get a little bit of money. In addition to that, your impact factor would go up. So they sold out to Springer eventually. Uh, I don't believe that this was a very good idea at that time. And I don't think the money was really needed. Uh, there are other ways of uh, getting journal finances to become better. But nevertheless, I think Europe did it. So I think India has also followed. Thank you, sir. So there is a one more question from uh... Dr. Rajendra Babu, uh, Assistant Professor Tumkur University. So his question is, currently the academic integrity scenario is such a, such that scholars are assessed based on their publication in high impact factor journals, which are mostly published uh, by the giant publishing houses. So it has become a sort of vicious circle to pay and publish in the name of open access Sir, what do you think is the solution for this? See, here you have to understand this. Right now, there are very good journals which have always been there, for which our libraries are still paying subscription. But these journals also publish open access articles where someone pays in order for the article to go open access. So these are mixed journals. You can still find high impact journals where you don't pay any money to publish. But many journals which are high impact have gone completely to the pay and publish model because they claim that they are making their work open access. Now, when I'm an author, I don't want to pay. When I'm a reader, I want to read everything. And this is why. There is this problem in the scientific community because one day you're an author and other day you're a reader. As a reader, you want everything to be accessible, but as an author, you don't want to pay for your publication. I think the old model in which we have, I think what is needed in India really is negotiated agreements with publishers on a countrywide scale. That is not being done in India. Uh, we have too many consortia and too many individual uh, groups uh, negotiating with publishers. And the publishers are now making a lot of money on this. If we had one single negotiation with a country, both for access and also for publishing, maybe we would know exactly how much money we would spend. But this requires, I think, governmental initiative and uh, a common way of approach. China has this. So there is a question from uh, Dr. G. Mahesh, a senior principal scientist, uh, CSIR headquarters. So his yes. question goes, uh, clearly there seems to be no escape from extortionist approaches of uh, publishers. On contrary, there are new players, the new age corporate metric gurus, and uh, the plagiarism software uh, magnets who seems to be sharpening their claws to predate on institutional budgets. So how can institution cope up with this onslaught? Uh, can I ask you a question, Dr. Mahesh? Are you from CSIR in Delhi? Yes, sir. He is from uh, CSIR headquarters, Delhi. Okay. If you are from CSIR headquarters in Delhi, the right people to ask this question to are in Delhi. 
for example, the UGC, the CSIR, the DST, all of them should get together to sort of implement rational policies. If UGC prescribes Turnitin as a software that needs to be used, then everybody will have to buy Turnitin. Tomorrow there will be another software. And I don't think we should get into this. Uh, we need to ask the question, how much money do we want to spend on journals and on ensuring the integrity of the academic process? Once that is decided, that should be done commonly. Right now, you have different consortia dealing with the publishers. CSIR has its own consortium. UGC has its own consortium. MHRD has its own consortium. And I think the publishers laugh all the way to the bank. Shivram, if you can permit me, can I ask one question in this regard? Yeah, please go ahead. I think uh, what you are suggesting is uh, the model three academies uh, put together, discussed and came out. The one nation, one subscription, ONOS, which is being uh, debated, uh, not a debated extensively, but uh, <clears throat> being uh, uh, concerned by the, um, the current innovation for the science policy and draft document. Uh, now, it, uh, the academies also projected something around 1500 crores as the amount spent currently on scientific journals in India, which is a very grossly overestimated sum. And the second part is when uh, uh, at the end of the day, this whole model of uh, buying the journals through a one single uh, negotiation amounts to uh, using this sort of base and negotiating with the publishers, which again amounts to uh, half a dozen major commercial mm -hmm. publishers and a dozen society publishers, uh, in which we are, when currently uh, this, all these consortia put together are making available, uh, providing access to not more than about uh, uh, 5,000 uh, institutions, not all universities though. Now, in this scenario, the publishers are likely to hike up the whole price from 1,500 crores. It may even go to 2,000 or 2,500 crores. And with the open access movement catching up extensively, you, all, you are already aware uh, authors are also paying money. Uh, the scientific publishing is, I guess, itself is at the crossroads. Science journal publishing at the crossroads. Uh, does it make really sense to uh, go ahead, uh, you know, in a rush for uh, a national consortium of buying journals by one agency allocating some 2,000 plus crores. Uh, that, will it really serve the purpose, which again will only provide access to what you mentioned as about 42% of the journals controlled by these publishers, and rest of the 50 plus 50% of the journals again will be left out. You know, I think this is a financial matter. I don't know where this number of 1500 crores came from. Okay. Yeah. In fact, academy, yeah, academy okay. this. When you're dealing with money, you need to see how the figure is actually arrived at. But I would say this, that the open access movement has caused more problems than it has solved. Uh, right now, what is happening is because of this mixed kind of journal model, uh, we are paying both ways. Right. Uh, what we need is for many journals which are open access, our authors also should not have to pay individual charges, but those charges must now be borne by uh, like a subscription fee. This can be done, but I think we need to ask how many journals do we want to get? How much is it going to cost and where is it going to come from? See, outside this, what is done by the major publishers and the major societies, it's important to ask, what are the other journals that we want to buy? See, when we did this exercise in a very limited way at the Indian Institute of Science, we found that we had many journals in the library in which nobody wanted to read the journal and nobody wanted to publish in the journal. 
So in such a situation, you don't know why you should buy the junk. So I don't know what this would be on a countrywide scale. But certainly institutions will find it much easier if negotiations were done on a slightly grander scale than left to institutions. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have Dr. Pujar uh, from IGIDR uh, Mumbai. Dr. Pujar, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, it was a very ex excellent talk, sir, and I really an eye opener for all of us uh, and how the science publishing and uh, in the modern era how it is going in. Really, it is a uh, uh, worrying uh, for all of us, sir. I have one question in the today. Uh, the many of the publishers at international level, they are undertaking transformative agreements, wherein that uh, the they say that read and publish in the sense that uh, institution can subscribe. And whereas authors can publish there without paying any APC, that kind of agreements they are undertaking. And I think in India also only one of the publisher, Cambridge University Press, uh, who have undertaken this uh, kind of agreement with uh, E. Shodha Sindhu, the consortium of Infilnet, wherein that uh, any of the subscribing institute can publish uh, the, their articles into Cambridge journals without paying any APC. May I know, sir, what your take on this? Is it going to be benefit for open access, or is it going to bring in uh, kind of a uh, so whether that authors can publish in uh, renowned journals. Thank you. Sir. This is, uh, I think, uh, exactly you're just stating in another way yes. what I was thinking aloud. That is, right now we have we are paying to read, yes, we are sir. also paying to publish. Yes, sir. What we need is arrangements in which both these things happen. But the sum of money that we paid is a tightly negotiated sum of money. Yes, sir. You are right. So this would be the model eventually. Like for example, yes, sir. completely yes, sir. open journals like the Public Library of Science and so on, they do, I think, offer this option to institutions. But the amount of money that is asked from institutions would depend on how many articles are likely to come from that institution. Yes, sir. See, the number of articles in a given journal will depend on how strong an institution is in that field in order to be able to publish that. I agree, sir. I agree. And so this requires a lot of uh, first analysis and then negotiation. Yes, sir. Yes. You, you are absolutely right, sir. You are absolutely right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, I have uh, one query on, uh, on uh, the Sahib or uh, pirated sites, what you referred in your uh, presentation. And some of mm -hmm. our audience also has mentioned that. Sir, as an mm -hmm. author, I can take shelter of a fair use clause or uh, the count to guidelines if I get a, a research paper from the, uh, these kind of sites. But as an institution, uh, what will be the legal uh, implication on institution? Because uh, copyright is a, a powerful legal tool for publisher who always uh, uh, take uh, take on institutions. Uh, if you if you download, if you are the institution researchers, download uh, articles from these kind of sites. So, what is your uh, views on that, sir? See, my views on that is now it has become a free for all. I would like to see publishers like Elsevier now try to have a copyright infringement suit on authors in India and let it be done in an Indian court. I don't think this will work. International publishers have had you blindly signed. I'm not really enforceable in many ways. Especially for your own use, for reading, for dissemination, I don't think that this holds. In fact, one of the architects of the open archives movement, Stephen Harnard, his initial solution was to make open archives by putting the pre-publication version of every paper on an open archive, on an institutional archive. So what does the, that is not the same as the final published version. So there's no copyright infringement. I don't think this copyright infringement is something that institutions are worried about. I don't think they understand what it is and they've never had a case against them. And if so, where will that case be done? An individual author has signed something and given it. I don't believe this. 
I think this is just a threat by the uh, multinational publishers. So thank you, sir. Sir, we have one last question from uh, Bibhuti Bhushan Sahu, uh, Deputy Librarian from IIT Bhubaneswar. Mm -hmm. So his question goes like this. Do you think Indian researchers can come together to publish research papers and uh, senior professionals can take a lead in that? Uh, research papers where? Maybe Indian Indian journals kind of thing. That's what uh, he means. <laughs> Can Indian journals be improved so that more of our work appears in Indian journals? No, this is unlikely to happen as long as the evaluation system in India, the reward system in India, requires international recognition. So I think this is not going to happen at all. It has not happened for so many decades. It is not likely to happen in the future. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, valuable uh, uh, suggestions and interactions. Now, I request uh, Professor Kempraju, uh, Presidential, uh, to give his views for this. Sir, please go ahead, sir. So, friends, uh, I think more than nearly about one and a half hour, we had a very good uh, interaction and presentation by our distinguished speaker. I think. Uh, particularly the management of uh, the journal publications in the libraries, uh, both in terms of subscription as well as the promoting its use, is one of the very important and also challenging tasks for our librarians. Because the changing shift of uh, physical medium of periodical publications has not only helped us to get a wider as well as the greater access, but also the lot of uh, challenging tasks in terms of the management of those literature, keeping in view the financial aspects are concerned. And uh, so this kind of an uh, issues we always used to come across and we have to take note of all these kinds of changes and hope that uh, this uh, seminar or the lecture presentation has helped our librarians to greater extent to think once again there and also strategize their actions and priorities in collection management of periodical publications for effective use of these resources. So uh, finally, join me in expressing our gratitude to Professor Balram Sir for accepting our request and uh, uh, delivering this lecture in an excellent manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, sir, for your uh, kind remarks. I request uh, uh, Envy Satyarayana to give his opinion. Uh, friends, it is a wonderful lecture, uh, a great treat for Diwali that we have received from Professor Balram. And I would like to thank uh, particularly uh, the Academy, Lisa, for organizing this lecture. Uh, and uh, Professor Balram's uh, lecture has raised several, several questions for which I am not sure whether we all can find an answer at all, particularly today, the science, scholarly communication in. Uh, a kind of a crossroad as much as uh, as he said the library science is in a crossroad sometimes i wonder whether we should take a very fundamental look at the very animal called journal uh, which is something uh, which is uh, more than uh, three four hundred year old uh, gift by the civilization to the society whether this uh, animal called journal should it really undergo as any kind of a uh, you know metamorphic changes or whether we need to reinvent something entirely different to replace this concept of journal itself to find a new solution because often uh, the right models can emerge with a totally disruptive uh, approach and uh, i would uh, say that uh, this is an area which continues to uh, be under uh, uh, what I would say continues to be under controversies, also with a lot of uh, misgivings about uh, even about the publishing industry. Uh, not all science publishing journals are making the kind of profits, but you know, it's only confined to a few major consolidated publishers. A lot of good journals are being shut down, also. It certainly requires a major change. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Lisa Academy for this uh, 
wonderful uh, treat the lecture arrange and i wish all of you a very happy diwali thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, kind remarks and uh, we have come to an end of this program uh, uh, during this program we conducted a, a short quiz uh, for all our participants and i request uh, dr professor ponnur to share uh, quiz results then we will uh, end this program by with a formal vote of thanks by uh, dr anand bairappa yes sir uh, mr kaustu chakraparthi uh, maharani krishishwari college kolkata uh, he has been a winner of the quiz competition and uh, he is the topper and uh, he will be sent a certificate along with a memento um, thank you and i congratulate uh, kaustav chakrabarti now i request dr anand bairappa to propose vote of thanks it's time for vote of thanks uh, at the outset i would like to thank lis academy for giving opportunity to iic library to host this first inaugural lecture series delivered by professor balram also former director of indian institute of science uh, what a beginning we got uh, for this very ambitious and long awaited monthly lecture series of lis academy all this happened because we are honored to have with us professor balram uh, former director of indian institute of science who is a great scholar uh, accomplished scientist and able administrator and also a policy maker who delivered today a very insightful uh thought provoking and uh, very motivating lecture on science publishing greed vanity and uh, the decline of the scholarship which has set a clear benchmark for all our future lecture series sir we can't thank you enough for this wonderful lecture however we would like to thank you for accepting our honor by honoring you we got honored so thank you very much once again for this wonderful talk i would like to thank uh, Professor T D Kempraju, Vice Chancellor of Bangalore North University, for accepting our invitation to chair uh, the core committee of L I S Academy lecture series, which has resulted in uh, getting best in class speakers for our lecture series. Uh, sir, uh, we would like to thank you for your insightful thoughts and uh, suggestions uh, that help us to take the lecture series a long way uh, for the. benefit of lis profession in india and abroad with this brief may i request professor konnu president of lis academy to honor and also felicitate uh, today's uh, inaugural lectures president professor td kempraju I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of LIS Academy and IIC Library, Dr. Meera, former uh, librarian of Raman Research Institute, B. S. Shivaram uh, from NIL, and uh, Nirmala from IIC Library, and her team for all the support uh, in making this success uh, today. Uh, and also, I would like to thank one and all here uh, for their graceful presence and making this lecture a grand success. And uh, not but the least this lecture series is a beginning and uh, we have planned every month lectures on second saturday of every month uh, so on this occasion i would like to request all of you to be part of that and to make all of them a successful and also a learning experience thank you one and all